and welcome for the latest in the Roman Rose Research Association series of talks. Um, very quickly before we start, just want to remind everybody uh, that this talk is being recorded. And if you can make sure that you remain muted with your videos off um, for the duration of the talk. Um, if you want to put any questions to um, Nigel and Ed, then please use the chat to do so. Those will be passed to me at the end. Um, and I'm guessing most of you are familiar with the method we use now. And um, then I'll put that to them at the end. I'm just going to hang on for a few minutes because I see there's still quite a lot of people coming in. Um, so as expected, we will be a couple of minutes late starting, um, which gives me some time to give you a few intro introductions. Um, Tonight, we're pleased to introduce uh, Nigel Rothwell and Dr. Ed Pebbler, who will talk to us about reinterpreting Roman roads in the Chilterns. Bear with me, I just had an alert come up on the screen in front of me. Um, four years ago, the Chilterns Conservation Board acquired high resolution LIDAR data to investigate archaeological features. Um, particularly the Iron Age within the Chilterns. Um, and the data was then made publicly accessible through the Beacons of the Past project, which is, became sort of a citizen science project, if I understand it right. Uh, and Nigel and Ed are going to talk to us about some of the results they've got from that. Uh, Nigel himself um, is not an archaeologist. He actually trained, excuse me a minute, my screen's disappeared. There we go, got my notes. Uh, he trained as a geologist and a geochemist, and after various uh, managerial and technical positions, um, he retired a couple of years ago when he was able to indulge his interests in landscape history and archaeology, um, along with history of science. He helps to run the Chilterns branch of the Young Archaeologists Club. It's quite busy. Um, membership secretary for the Buckinghamshire Archaeological Society and visitor engagement at London Science Museum. I'm surprised he finds time to do things like he's doing tonight. Um, he's been involved with the Chilton Conservation Board's Beacon of the Past project since its inception, and especially with LIDAR interpretation. Um, and it was because of that he actually took a particular interest in investigating Roman roads, um, partly because the best preserved section of road in the Chilterns, which we'll see tonight, was one of the very first new discoveries made. Moving on to Ed, um, he did his doctorate at Oxford, uh, which was on the production, trade and use of building materials in Roman Oxfordshire. Uh, he worked for the Chilterns AOMB from 2018 to 2021, um, specifically on the National Lottery Heritage Fund um, funded project Beacons of the Past, which is the one responsible for what we're going to hear tonight, uh, which used LIDAR to explore the, the archaeology of the Chilterns, um, it was quite innovating in the way to engage the public through uh, citizen science approaches, quite similar actually to the project that we heard um, earlier in the month from um, Devon and Cornwall run by Chris Smart. Um, he's now just started a new job working for the Forestry Commission uh, in the southeast of England, um, advising on sustainable forestry and how it can contribute to the preservation and enhancement of the historic environment. Right. Um, so without further ado, I think we'll make a start because the numbers now seems to be fairly static. Uh, can I, uh, right, I don't exactly know what's happened to the screen there. Just bear with me. All right, we should be on speak of you. Um, if I can hand over to Nigel and Ed to make a start. Good evening, everyone. Hopefully everyone can see and hear me now. Give me a thumbs up, Nigel, if you can see and hear me. Yeah, cool, good stuff. Welcome everyone, great to see so many of you uh, here tonight and lovely to see lots of people local to the Chilterns as well. Um, this evening, as Mike said there, we're gonna be telling you a bit about um, the insights that we kind of got from several years of studying the Chilterns LIDAR data that was acquired um, as part of the Beacons of the Past project that Mike mentioned that I worked on a few years ago now from yeah, 2018 to 2021. I've had two jobs since then. I was the um, count, one of the county archaeologists in East Berkshire until last week. And then since Monday, I've been working for the Forestry Commission. So I apologize if um, 
my head isn't quite uh, uh, all there because it's been a busy week, but um, we'll try. I'll try and do my best, and, and I'm sure Nigel can uh, pick up the pieces if all goes wrong. Um, but as you can see the title there, we're interpreting Roman Roads in the Chilton's Insights from LIDAR. And a bit of a, a kind of broad theme that perhaps works well for, for what we're going to be talking about is this lovely image from, from Asterisk. Asterix, um, him and Obelix veering off the beautiful paved main Roman road with its milestones and, and lovely large bits of sort of basalt paving um, onto a lovely little dirt side road. And it's those dirt side roads that we will certainly be coming back to later on in the talk. Um, I should say Nigel and I are going to sort of swap between ourselves as we go on through it. And um, hopefully the technology will, will cope with us. So a bit of an outline of, of the talk this evening. Um, I'm going to start by introducing the Beacons of the Past project, BOTP, um, and the LiDAR data um, before we move on to a little bit of an introduction to Romans in the Chilterns, or sort of some of the stuff that we know, we don't know a great deal really, um, to give those of you who aren't necessarily all that local a bit of context. Um, then Nigel's going to tell us a bit about kind of the historical background to the study of Roman roads in this region, um, and tell, talk a little bit about identifying Roman roads from LiDAR data. I know Chris Smart um, spoke to you a couple of weeks ago um, and sort of gave some, some brilliant stuff from down in the Southwest. Um, Nigel's gonna have a bit of a deep dive into kind of the technicalities of, of how we can and how confident we can be in terms of identifying these things from remote sensing data. And then we're gonna have a look at a few examples of what we've got in the Chilterns and our views on perhaps classifying roads into sort of different subsets. Um, and then finally, Nigel's gonna be giving us a really good deep dive onto one particular Roman road, the so-called Camlet Way, Roman Road 163, um, which runs from Silchester to Verulamium, and finish by wrapping up with some conclusions. So let's crack on. Um, Oh, yep, starting off with Beacons of the Past and LIDAR. So the Children's Conservation Board, CCB, they in 2018 embarked on this project called Beacons of the Past, uh, which was funded predominantly by the National Lottery Heritage Fund, um, uh, as well as other partners as well, including the Children's Society and the National Trust. And the, the key aims of this project were really to look at Iron Age archaeology in the children's landscape. So us being here talking about Roman roads tonight is, is a bit of a diversion from that. Um, but one of the key parts of the project and the thing that I spent most of my time working with um, was we commissioned and flew uh, 1,400 square kilometres of high resolution LIDAR data. Um, as lots of you know, Chris Smart last week was talking about the data available from the Environment Agency. Um, which, has been, which has now been flown across the entire country, of, of the entirety of England, I should say. Um, but that's typically at what's called one meter resolution. So we typically have one measurement of where the ground surface is for every meter squared on the ground. Um, with the Chilton's LiDAR, we flew at 25 centimeter resolution, which meant we had 16, at least 16 measurements um, of where the ground surface was uh, for every meter squared across that 1400 square kilometers. So 16 times the detail basically, um, which means we can spot far more archeology span I think than you can in one meter data. And you can spot sort of far more subtle archeology, span far, far less well preserved things perhaps, or things that were never quite as big in the first place. Um, and we had so much data um, and we really wanted to kind of engage people. That was obviously a big part of the project. And so we put it all online for, for anyone anywhere in the world to come and look at. So we launched this thing called our, our, Ch our Children's LiDAR portal, uh, where the data was hosted. Um, you just had to log in and you could look at the LiDAR imagery alongside modern ordnance survey mapping, historic ordnance survey mapping, um, aerial imagery, um, and various other kind of layers and bits of data as well to really help contextualize it um, there are a lot of tutorials on there. You can still go on the website down there at the bottom. Um, you can still go on the website. There's tutorials on there in how to read LiDAR data, trying to interpret it and, and find features in it, basically. Um, and we had great fun. We had um, three years. And I mean, the lucky thing was, well, lucky, unlucky thing. Um, we launched this in August 2019, which, of course, was about nine months before the COVID pandemic hit. So in some ways, the timing couldn't have been better in terms of allowing people to continue um, using the data because we had it all online already. We had to move our nice workshops that we had in village halls and um, uh, uh, kind of, you know, out in person to, to being online via the hated teams. We were just talking uh, before the session started about um, people's bugbears with um, different types of remote kind of conferencing software. Um, so we moved on to Teams and Zoom and everything went online. 
Um, this is just a quick map showing the area of the LIDAR survey. So you can see the children's A O M B in the sort of green outline. It's funny little exclave up beyond Luton, um, all the way down to the Thames, the Goring Gap down here in Oxfordshire, Reading just here, and of course, central London here. The blue area is the area that was flown in our survey. So it included all of South Buckinghamshire um, and a little kind of stretch off into Hertfordshire um, and the red dots of the hill forts that were kind of focus of the project. Um, a quick summary of what LIDAR is and how it works. I promise to be super quick with this. Um, it's not what we hear to hear about really is it but um, basically we have a light aircraft flying backwards and forwards across the landscape it has a very fancy expensive bit of kit on hanging off the bottom of the plane that's firing laser pulses um, at very high frequency down towards the ground um, and these just like with something like sonar or radar these reflect back up to the plane and there's a sensor on the plane that detects those reflections those echoes that are coming back um, from whatever those laser pulses have hit and bounced back off of. Um, and of course, sometimes they might hit trees or buildings or bits of vegetation, um, which is not what we're interested in. The great thing about this is we're firing so many laser pulses, about 2 million every second, um, that some of them will get down between the branches of trees, between leaves, between you know um, the leaves of bits of bracken and things like that. Hopefully with the aim that we get loads and loads of reflections off the ground surface. We can then um, kind of process that data and in doing so build up a really high resolution model of all the lumps and bumps that occur across the ground surface, even under woodland. And that's the really important thing. Um, the Chilterns has um, about 20% tree cover. And so that makes it traditionally very difficult to survey archaeologically because woodland is hard to kind of go and spot lumps and bumps in. But it conversely has the benefit that it protects lumps and bumps very well. So if they're not being ploughed, they're not being eroded, you know, weathered down, um, then those archaeological lumps and bumps can survive really well under the tree cover. And so now with this fantastic technology of LIDAR at very high resolutions, we can in great detail map subtle lumps and bumps and visualize that data to really um, build up a picture of, of surviving earthworks e even under tree cover and especially under tree cover. So um, that's what the data looks like if you leave the trees in basically, and we can then strip them bare, strip them away, and you can see all this fantastic detail preserved, particularly in woodlands. So we've got a little rectilinear enclosure here, um, various pits and things going on here. So a bit of a linship to sort of um, ancient field boundary on the slope of the hill coming around here. And you can see conversely out here in the, in the arable field that's been plowed year after year, it's sort of snooker table flat. You can't see a single feature in there because they've all been destroyed by the plough. Whereas here in the woodland, they've been protected under tree cover and we have a chance to detect those features. Just a very quick bit of context in terms of Romans in the Chilterns. Um, firstly, I guess we should talk about before the Romans turn up. Um, what do we know about uh, the Iron Age um, and the Chilterns? Um, certainly the early and middle Iron Age, we know that we've got a, a decent number of hill forts being built in this area. And that was obviously what the Beacons of the Past project primarily set out to investigate this um, good concentration of about 20, 20 plus hill forts within a, a relatively small area. Um, by the late Iron Age, we, we kind of think of Britain as having been well, dividing itself up into broad tribal areas. Um, obviously debates to be had about quite how hard any you know, boundaries that you can possibly draw on such a map are. Um, but most of the Chilterns would fall in an area that we broadly would think of as being um, Catavalloni territory, primarily based out of their tribe, a sort of um, proto-urban centre um, at Verilemion, as it potentially was known, um, founded in the, certainly in the, in the second half of the first century BC, probably. Um, uh, another thing to point out, potentially the Thames being a kind of soft border, let's say, with a different travel group down to the southwest, the Atrabates, based potentially at Silchta and another of, a number of other um, kind of proto-urban sites in that area. Um, by AD 43, we know that Verilemion has become Verilemium, uh, Roman St Albans, um, and develops fairly rapidly into um, a pretty major town, basically. Um, you can see here a plan um, up in the top right hand corner. It's tilted like this for the, for the true orientation. Always got to have north at the top. Um, uh, but you can see we've got lovely grid plan um, by the third century. You get lovely walls around the edges um, and we have lots of wonderful civic buildings in there as well and around the edges, including um, a very nice sort of basilica, um, a theater, um, 
bar suites, etc. All the things you'd want from a from a good Roman town. Um, we know in AD 60 to 61, it's burnt by Boudicca. It's obviously a big enough and important enough site for her to target. And archaeologists have found the destruction layer, so-called destruction layer, you know, burnt material that dates to roughly that period to kind of um, verify the arc of the historic record. Um, and probably the most important thing for us to be thinking about is over here on the southwest sort of side of the um, walled town is the so-called Silchester Gate, named by Wheeler. Obviously, we don't know if it's, its Roman name, um, which obviously faces towards Silchester and is where we think of as being the, the springing point for Roman Road 163 um, major road down to the southwest towards Silchester. Across the rest of the Jiltons, um, we don't actually know a great deal. It's not an area that's seen vast quantities of development and therefore kind of the development led archaeology that would be finding us, um, you know, Roman settlement as a part of the kind of planning system. And similarly, as I mentioned, the tree cover means that finding sites through crop marks is, is difficult as well. Um, where fields aren't being ploughed, we're not getting those um, chance finds being brought up to the surface, like bits of building material, um, et cetera, bits of pottery that might tell us where settlement is. And so actually comparatively, the Chilterns is probably under sort of studied or certainly um, under known, under understood in, in terms of um, what's happening in it in the Rome period. We assume it probably has relatively little military presence because we haven't found that evidence. Um, we know that there are other towns kind of around the edges like Dorchester on Thames which grows into a walled town by the third century and, and has origins earlier. Um, we know that Dunstable Duro Cornovium becomes a reasonably um, sort of prosperous little town. Ulchester further north modern Vista or just outside modern Vista um, also grows up into a walled town and has a military presence certainly. Um, but the Chilterns itself being sort of upland potentially not being the best farmland um, we know relatively less about. We assume, well, we know there's, there's there's farming settlements. There's probably a few high status villas, but we don't potentially see the density that we might see elsewhere in the country. Uh, and we know that the timber is almost certainly going to be being exploited for um, iron and pottery production. And we do have a fair amount of evidence of iron production from Chilton Woods. We don't generally know the dates um, from which it comes. We kind of assume it may be Iron Age and Roman, um, but generally we don't have very much dating evidence to go with it. So yeah, a very relatively sparse picture, really. Um, you can see here the major Roman, some of the major Roman roads across here, and of course we'll be talking more about those um, and pointing out the ones that we're interested in this evening. But now I'm going to hand over to Nigel to tell us a bit about kind of the history of studying Roman roads in this region. Uh, thanks, Ed, and um, good evening to everybody. I think that Ed, I've just requested control from you. Um, I'm going to go on and uh, introduce some of the work done on Roman roads by uh, various historical researchers. Um, but as Ed has, uh, has, has alluded to, it's important to note there is a lack of modern published Roman research across the region, probably in large part because of the absence of development-led archaeological investigation. Um, typically, the Chilterns is uh, an intensively worked agricultural landscape in post-medieval and modern times. So as Ed has mentioned, the fact that there is so much woodland cover makes the, the LIDAR so particularly interesting to, to uh, modern investigators. Um, and historically then, the Chilterns has, has tended to be seen as a bit of a, a, a late Iron Age and Roman backwater with little evidence of occupation and development uh, away from the larger centres. Actually overturning this received wisdom is perhaps one of the key surprises arising from the Beacon's work. Now, I'm sure most of the uh, most of tonight's audience will recognize this as Ivan Margari. He's the key historical chronicler of the Roman road network through the province of, uh, of, of Britannia. And his various editions of Roman roads in Britain, uh, the most recent one dating from as recently as 1973, still remains the most complete and essential guide to the Roman road network. But increasingly aspects of that documentation have been called into question. And that's often been the subject I've noted of, uh, of this forum and tonight's probably no exception. And I need to move that on. There we go. Okay, so this image is the broadly accepted view of the distribution of Roman roads across England and Wales. It's actually taken from the Royal Settlement of Roman Britain project, but it's based on, on, on Margaret's book. Now, our region sits here in the, in the Chilterns, and there's 
a total of 21 historically documented Roman roads lying within or cutting through this region. Um, mostly though, intriguingly, not all, but mostly, these are documented in Margaret's 1973 third edition book. Um, and he assigned the standard numbering convention that we continue to use. And Marguerite was also the chair of a group known as the, the Via Torres, who had in 1964 documented the Roman roads in the, in the Southeast Midlands. And this is the area that, uh, that, that they covered. Their work and detailed description really provides the essential starting point for our research. And one might make the observation here that apparently there is a higher density of roads across much of this region and across the rest of the country. Uh, and that we think is an important observation for our story. Now, their historical approach largely looked at linear alignments on the ground and in aerial photographs. They looked also at the position of administrative boundaries and they did some field identification work, mostly through probing for metal surfaces, but with some limited uh, excavation. Uh, and this association, the Roman Rose Research Association, has established its aim of updating Marjorie's work, um, but also the RRRA hosts the archive of field survey data from, uh, from the Ordnance Survey, amongst which are some quite interesting unpublished accounts. And particularly for us, um, there's an account written by, an, an unpublished account written by McColm in 1980, which looks at part of the Verilane and Silchester Road. And I'll come back and talk about this a little bit more detail when I come onto the, onto the Camlet Way. And there are some other historical and antiquarian authors who doc documented observations on possible routes, either omitted by Marguerite and the Via Torres, or on variations of their routes. Morris was part of the Via Torres group, uh, and although he, together with Hargreaves and Parker, described an A40 corridor route in 1970, for some intriguing reason, that didn't get included in Marguerite's 1973 volume. And Maurice Hargreaves and Parker also looked at the Ichneald Way along the foot of the Children's Escarpment in 1968. Uh, Harrison also looked at that in 2003, and a different Harrison undertook a magnetometry survey of part of Ackerman Street in 2014. Um, and Malpas looked at a route from Dorchester on Thames towards Henley in 1987. And then lastly, originally identified by David Staveley and Environment, Environment Agency LIDAR data. In 2017, John Gover documented the first indication of a different alignment for RR163. Other authors have um, also provided observations on the Verulanium to Silchester route, particularly though uh, down at the Berkshire end, more around the, the, the Silchester region. And the most relevant, I will mention again later, but Bernard's notes on the Camelot Way from 1926, Boone's work on Silchester in 1957, and then the most recent piece really pulling together University of Reading Silchester Environments Project um, in a collation by Trusco in 2017. And I think the thing to note here is that most of these historical sources are somewhat dated, but that is essentially the extent of the published record on Roman roads in this area. So as Roman road researchers, I think many of us have now become quite familiar with looking at LIDAR data, but I know not everybody in the audience is going to be that familiar with, uh, with what we've been looking at. And so I'm going to look at what we might expect to see when we're looking for a Roman road in our data uh, and, and make the upfront observation that they don't necessarily look like this. Um, and this is uh, RR73, southwest of Brough in, in Wensleydale. Uh, and also going to consider a few uh, a few pitfalls that we can need to look out for as well. So we've already seen this image. We've used it quite a lot to promote findings from the Beacons project, and it was in the flyer for this talk. And it's where we started our investigation, it really in Hodgemore Woods, which in the parish of Sea Green, which is almost in my back garden in many respects. And this type of display for those less familiar with looking at the LIDAR data, is an example of a local relief model. Effectively, uh, what the, uh, the processing has done here is removed the topography 
so that uh, somebody's saying that that's um, uh, not a very good connection. Am I coming across okay? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, yeah, this is a, an example of a local relief model. Effectively, the topography is being removed. So we're looking at uh, a, a relative elevation with pale being a positive feature. So it's elevated and dark negative. So it's depressed relative to adjacent pixels. And hopefully everybody can see the, the, the northeast southwest linear feature through here. Uh, and this is an area of ancient woodland. And it's one of the very first things we saw when we started looking at the Beacons data set. And just to pick that out, just so that nobody's any doubt as to what we're looking at here. And it runs for a little over a, a kilometer. And it's everything we might want to see in a prototypical Roman road. I mean, it's laser straight, it's elevated in the center, so it appears to be built on a camber dagger. It's got roadside ditches uh, for either for quarrying, road metalling, and or drainage. The agar is about 12 meters wide. That's about 40 PDs. So that's quite a quite a broad road. And the ditches are about 20 meters apart, uh, roughly 60 PDs. It's not dissimilar, therefore, in size to Ermine Street. And it's significantly wider than, uh, than many Roman roads, suggesting that it is of some importance. And various reference sources will tell us this is how Roman roads were routinely constructed with foundations, metal surfaces, and side dishes, uh, ditches. Obviously, the LIDAR can't tell us either the date for this feature nor can it tell us about its construction. And, and you know, I emphasize here that many of these features have not been dug, so we don't know that much about them. However, the reason we make so much of this particular stretch is that this is the best preserved section of Roman road within the Chilterns, but it's not typical of those historically described roads within the region. So what might we expect to be able to see in the LIDAR data that could tell us a feature is possibly Roman? Well, as with the Hodgmore example, we might recognize a positive elevated LIDAR feature, linear uh, and on an agar, or alternatively, it might be a negative eroded or sunken feature recognized as linear ditches, cuttings, or depressions. We might actually see evidence of an engineered cutting or a terrace way. And certainly as classically taught, we would expect to see long linear alignments. And these might today be represented by hedge lines, field boundaries or modern straight roads. But the LIDAR is particularly good at providing a wider aerial and geographic context for such observations. And along with the straight line alignments, we probably ought to expect to see evidence of controlled survey angular changes in direction. And also, as we've seen in Hodgmore, we might expect to see roadside ditches used for quarrying surface materials for metalling or for drainage. But we also need to corroborate that with other sources of evidence, aerial photographs, possibly administrative boundaries, the surrounding geography, the settlement, so what's the roads, what are the roads connecting up to, and perhaps even place names. And if it does exist, other remote sensing or excavation evidence. But some cautionary notes too, because all linear features do not necessarily lead to Rome. Within the Chilterns, it's very common to find that ancient field boundaries have been formed through the clearance of glacial gravels and pebbles and rounded flints. And they're sometimes, actually they're probably often linear and in the field on the ground, they can have the appearance of a buried agar. And there are many other linear features in the data, including of course, utility pipelines, disused railway lines and the turnpike roads. And although there are certainly places in the country where Roman road alignments have become fossilized into later administrative boundaries, 
And this example here on the right is of Deer Street uh, demarcating the limits of parish boundaries in North Yorkshire. But this seems to be very rare, exceptionally rare, really, in the Chilterns. So what do we actually see? Well, very few of the roads in the Chilterns exhibit such prototypical features. Um, those that do include Watling Street, running north from St Albans to Dunstable, Ackerman Street, cutting through the Chilterns northwest from St Albans to Fleet Marston, um, RR22 from Baldock to Sandy, 163, the Camlet Way, which I'll come back and talk to in, in, uh, in a lot more detail. 170 from Limbury or by Limbury and Sharpenhoe. And Ed's going to go on and talk about aspects of these shortly. And certainly what was good for the Romans is unsurprisingly also good for modern communications. And that's quite possibly because many of these routes follow the topography and drainage pattern within the Chilterns. And therefore major Roman routes have tended to become eclipsed by the modern road network. So we're hiding the evidence. The new recognition of the Chilterns as an intensively farmed Romano-British landscape must mean that many communication routes would also have been in prehistoric use, possibly adopted and adapted by the Romans, though it's obviously very difficult to prove. And that intensively late Iron Age and Romano-British agricultural landscape is very difficult to date, but there must have been routes within and through it, which provided connectivity across the landscape at a variety of different levels uh, reef for different purposes. So I'm going to hand back to Ed to take us through a few of those examples, show you what we've seen and how we've attempted to go about classifying our observations. Thank you, Nigel. Yeah. So we have come up with, and we're probably not the first people to do this, uh, but we haven't, we've struggled to actually find reference so maybe at the end people in the chat can point us towards useful reading uh, on similar thoughts that other people have had we're proposing a tripartite division for the roads that we've or the trackways that we've seen in the lidar data that we think are likely to be at least later prehistoric or roman um we've decided to call them the obvious things so we've got our a roads um those major roads for long distance into re inter regional use perhaps um, we might expect them to have been built and controlled by the administration or the military. We might have surveyed and engineered them, perhaps largely de novo, you know, as new new things in the landscape when the Romans arrived. We expect these, as Nigel just said, to be straight, perhaps to have an agar, um, to have some evidence of roadside ditches, to be those prototypical Roman roads. Our B roads. Um, we think these are more likely to be for local intra-regional use. They might be a connection between a main road and between settlements. Um, they might in particular follow the topography, whereas A roads might kind of ignore the topography. Our B roads might follow ridges or follow valleys, possibly even reusing earlier routeways um, with just a, maybe some re-engineering in the Roman period, the, the new creation of, of roadside ditches or an agar, for example, to resurface the road. And finally, we have our sea roads, which we imagine to be those ones that Asterix was turning off onto, um, connecting those minor roads to our farming settlements, um, connecting communities to their fields. Um, this is obviously us making stuff up, really, but um, there is a, a vague precedent in a text um, that is attributed to a, a Roman land surveyor known as Siculus Flaccus. Um, it is included in a sixth century treatise, but he probably is, is living and working in the second century AD. And he's talking about Italy, and we must you know, be, be honest about that. This doesn't necessarily apply to, to Britain, but he talks about a, a vague tripartite division in Italy between what he calls vi publici, the kind of main public roads that are upkept by the state, the vi vicinales, the sort of local um, municipal roads, and the vi Privati, the ones maintained by local landowners, villas, that kind of thing. And that seems to us to fit our proposed tripartite division here, which, which we think reflects the evidence that we're seeing in the LIDAR data. And again, I think the Chilterns has provided a really special case study because all the woodland that we have has meant that we potentially have a, a pretty unique opportunity to study um, 
Roman roads even down to these very minor local kind of farming uh, trackways, basically. So starting with the A roads, um, the most obvious one to talk about is Watling Street um, connecting London, well, uh, Canterbury originally, London, St Albans, Toaster, all the way up to Roxter, and I think all the way up to Anglesey. Um, you can see them being highlighted in yellow. So um, there we go, Watling Street to Roman Road 1E in Marguerite's uh, terminology. Uh, we have Aikman Street or Ackman Street, Roman Road 16A, um, kind of branching off broadly from St Albans or Alamium off towards um, Fleet Marston, Alchester, ultimately to Sirencester and over to the west in the Severn. Um, we have this interesting road that Nigel mentioned earlier, Roman Road X021, which was proposed by Morris, Hargreaves and Parker in 1970, but ignored by Marguerite in 1973. Um, this route that he suggests would connect Staines, Pontibus, relatively major Roman town on the Devil's Highway between London and Silchester. Um, heading up towards either Dorchester or Oldchester, getting another route through the Chilterns. And of course, the Camlet Way that Nigel's gonna be talking about later on. So just to quickly flick through these really, um, what do we know about Watling Street in our area? There we go, a major road joining Canterbury via London with Roxeter. In our area, it is mostly eclipsed by modern roads. We have very few areas where we would hope to, to see it basically. Um, it's marked on the modern OS map. It's obviously very well known. Um, there is one very short stretch where the Viatores suggest that the modern road, the A5183, does not in fact run over the top of Watling Street. And they identified um, this potential agar running through the fields, and they actually dug a trench across it and found what they termed a metal surface with uh, wheel ruts in it. And so they were fairly convinced that they had found an alter the alternative or the, the real alignment for Watling Street just here at Lodge Farm. This is just south of um, um, Dunstable, about a kilometer south of Dunstable, um, where the modern road hadn't destroyed the Roman road. Um, so there we go, we have their, their section drawing with their two wheel ruts and their metal surface. Um, the LiDAR data, I would say, is, is less clear. We certainly can see a bit of a, a raised bank running through here on the alignment that the Viatoris saw as well. And so, you know, certainly they spotted a raised bank. But if one follows this either further to the north or further to the south, it completely disappears. It is not apparent. The conclusions we can draw from that, either it is the course of Watling Street that Viatoris identified, um, and it just doesn't survive to the south and to the north of this particular section before it heads back under the modern Roman modern road. Um, it could be that the character of the road changes, which perhaps we wouldn't expect for such a major road as, as Watling Street, but perhaps it is built less well to the south here or, or less well to the north and so it doesn't survive as an agar through the fields as it does here. Um, and the third Alternative is that the Viatoras have got this wrong, um, that the, the feature that they found when they dug their section um, may well have been a trackway, but just wasn't Watling Street, may well have been um, just a field boundary built out of those cleared flints that Nigel mentioned being um, removed from fields. Um, so three possibilities there, I think, for, for what the Viatoras see in terms of their proposed route for Watling Street just here at Lodge Farm, south of Dunstable. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, Aikman Street, this is quite a fun one. So the Via Torres um, mark this as running along. Uh, so here we're just um, to the west of a place known as Cow Roast, which is um, just outside, just to the south of Tring, basically, north of Berkhamstead. Um, and the Via Torres mark Aikman Street coming through here as being aligned with this lovely field boundary um, and hedge and trackway along here, which, which seems reasonable. This is the 1945 RAF Ordnance Survey photo. Um, but those of you who are eagle-eyed may have noticed something else in this image, and that's um, this possible feature just slightly to the east in the middle of the field, maybe a hint of two parallel lines coming through the field. And when we looked at the LiDAR data, we were astonished to, to see two parallel lines running through the field here. Um, certainly the more northerly of the two looks like a ditch, it's a darker colour. The more subtly of the two is, is a bit hard to tell, it's, it's potentially a kind of bit of a ditch and a little bit of a bank. Um, we first, at first we saw this and thought oh, that's brilliant, We've, we can see a, a better alignment for Aikman Street through here, um, and this potentially agrees with, with a, a crop mark seen in that 1945 air photo, and it also agrees um, with some research um, 
done by um, Harrison 2015 published some geophysics of this field where they pretty convincingly identified this straight parallel kind of alignment coming through the field um, in the middle here. So potentially, yes, we can say that Via Torres was slightly wrong here again by you know, a few yards, not by much, and that the Roman road Aitman Street actually runs through the middle of this field here and potentially even survives as an earthwork in the middle of the field. Um, I'm slightly cautious about this one um, because A, it's quite surprising that um, the ditches of, of this road might survive in this field, but no evidence of an agar does. And that could just be because it never had an agar. It may well just have had roadside ditches. And we can see there's potentially evidence of roadside settlement here as well. So maybe that, that, that's a fair kind of conclusion. Um, uh, because we know this field has been heavily plowed, you can see these are this is probably post medieval ridge and furrow, if you can make it out, that just vaguely can be seen crisscrossing the field. So that barely survives. It's quite surprising that roadside ditches from the Roman period may well survive. Um, the other reason I'm slightly cautious is that Newground Farm, there's a reservoir you can see just there and a pumping station that dates back to uh, the Victorian period. And so um, it's quite possible that there is a, ro a um, Victorian water pipe um, running from Newground Farm into Carrowst and, and on into Berkhamsted that would almost perfectly also align with this feature. Um, so we can't say with 100% sort of certainty that this is definitely the course of the Roman road through here, um, but it, it's, it's a possibility and maybe a fun one to go and explore further. And certainly the geophysics adds some good evidence in terms of maybe having this sort of roadside um, enclosures uh, sort of aligned with it. Um, moving on quickly to Roman Road X021, um, proposed uh, by Morris Hargreaves. Oh, sorry, Ed. Ed, uh, I think there's there's quite a lot of uh, of noise coming from your mic. Oh, I'm if sorry. You, if you can if you can either tone it down or just push it away a little bit further, okay. perhaps. Sorry, is that any better? Is that better? Any better? Hopefully, I'll, I'll press on. Shout again if it's not good. Um, another example where. Um, Potentially, we have a realignment as, as demonstrated by the LIDAR data. Here you can see Morris Hargreaves and Parker's um, alignment here. Um, this is um, near Bulstrode um, in, in Buckinghamshire. Um, we have very little clear evidence of this route. As you can see, large parts of it are eclipsed by the M40 and the A40. Um, but here we potentially have a, a stretch of it um, visible maybe as an agar through fields here with roadside ditches. Um, becoming less clear as it comes over here to the west. Um, so another questionable one, perhaps one that Marguerite presumably didn't like for whatever reason, um, because he ignored it in, in his 1973 work, um, but a route that makes some logical sense in terms of connecting stains, um, crossing the Thames and heading on to the northwest. And we certainly have some Roman evidence from the vicinities, including Rye Villa and the pottery kilns at Hedgeley. Um, where this route might come out of the Chilterns on the northwest side, the, on the escarpment, um, is quite interesting because a key feature of this part of the Chilterns is, the, is deeply incised sunken ways that you can maybe make out here. Um, the, the scarp slope of the Chilterns is very, very steep, uh, about 50 meters you know, in places near, near vertical drops or certainly very, very steep. Um, and so sunken ways really characterize the way that people have kind of moved up and down this landscape. Um, here you can see the M40 coming through its cutting and potentially the route where RX021 comes out may well be this beautiful sunken way that the A40 then subsequently runs in. There's always a question of chicken and egg, which came first um, in terms of um, you know, modern roads going down these sunken ways versus um, what may have existed before, before then. Um, very quickly on 163, because Nigel's going to talk about this more in a second. Um, the Via Torres route joins villages of Sarat, Chorleywood, Chalfont St Giles, and crosses the Thames at Hedsa Wharf. Um, Dave Staveley and John Gover in 2017, using the Environment Agency data, um, they plot to identify a slightly different route to the north of, of about a kilometre to the north of the um, Via Torres route um, through a nice uh, preserved piece of agar in Pollard's Wood near Chalfont St Giles. And the beacons of the past LIDAR, as Nigel, as Nigel has said, um, then identifies a further section on exactly the same alignment going through Hodgemore Woods. Um, at the time that the beacons of the past LIDAR was released, the Environment Agency data hadn't covered Hodgemore. Um, so it was brilliant to have that to confirm that Dave Staveley and John Gover's finding um, up in Pollard's Wood. 
Um, here's what it looks like on the ground. Very hard to see here crossing a modern forestry track, um, but that agar, there it is coming through here. Um, I'll leave Nigel to talk more about this in, in detail in a second. Um, there are certainly still uncertainties about where this road crosses the Thames that uh, Nigel will talk about and its onward journey to Silchester. Quickly running through some B roads. Um, as Nigel mentioned, the Via Torres draw a whole, a very large number of little minor roads in this region um, that we kind of maybe think of as perhaps being a bit trigger happy. You know, we don't think this region is particularly blessed with Roman roads compared to the rest of the country. We think that it's just been studied in a way that has meant more have been identified and potentially some are spurious and potentially um, uh, they've just done a very good job of spotting more subtle, more minor roads that haven't necessarily been seen elsewhere. Um, Marguerite describes them as predominantly minor, which, which we would agree with and, and is clear from that pattern. Um, as I say, there is always a bit of a question of the quality of the evidence used for some of these. Um, and if we go by the patterns suggested by Via Torres, there are perhaps many other plausible candidates that, that weren't recognised or described by them, seemingly. Um, Here's an example that is uh, spot on identified by Via Torres and, and is, is a beautiful example, which is Roman Road 170, which connects um, Limbury near Luton up to Urchester in Northamptonshire. And this has some beautiful ruler straight, obviously surveyed sections. And the LIDAR shows us um, some really nicely preserved agar through here as well. Particularly, you can see within the woodland at George Wood um, that it survives really, really well, but also in the ploughed fields. Um, there's a bit of a question with this one in terms of its precise alignment as it comes down the escarpment. Um, the Via Torres have it um, on a ruler straight kind of alignment um, uh, that they, they draw in as, as the kind of perfect uh, surveyed alignment, but they identify that it probably comes down through this sunken way um, into Sharpenhoe, so it diverts slightly off the, the perfectly surveyed alignment. Um, in the LIDAR data, you can actually see there is perhaps a little bit of a kind of depressed feature, sunken feature coming down through the middle of this field that would be on the perfect alignment and a very short, steep section of, of sunken way. Um, so I think there is a question there as to whether there potentially was an attempt to, to get the road dead straight off the escarpment here using this kind of hollowed dry valley that comes back in against the escarpment um, or indeed whether very quickly people started to use and create this sunken way off this little promontory to the west of Sharpenhoe Clappers. Um, potentially some new insights coming from the LiDAR data. It's always very tempting. I'm sure lots of people in this room have um, sort of gone searching on Google Earth or wherever and found long straight alignments of field boundaries, et cetera, and thought, oh, could it be? It's very similar with LiDAR. You do exactly the same thing. Here's a lovely example, just coming south from Rona Road 168 um, through down through Lily. Um, towards uh, potentially um, uh, to Wellwyn, which we know is a Roman town. Um, and you can see this beautiful kind of sinuous field boundary that survives in places as a modern field boundary, in places as a ploughed out field boundary. Um, it's very tempting to suggest that, that you know, running on that alignment for that distance may well indicate that it has um, kind of earlier um, origins, potentially as a route way. Um, but without further, further work, um, certainly we can't prove anything with this kind of thing. Similarly, again, where we have those lovely hollow ways dipping off the edge of the Chiltern Escarpment, you can often draw faint lines from those curv curving away um, onto the Chiltern Plateau. Um, presumably these are always being used as route ways and have been for hundreds of years. It's very difficult to date them, unfortunately, um, even with lots of excavation. Finally, turning to our sea roads, and these are probably my favorite. Um, these are the really minor roads that were only ever lightly used in the first place, very lightly engineered, if at all. Um, and so we're always gonna be very difficult to spot. Often these kinds of things might only come out through excavation of large open areas. Um, but the Children's LiDAR data at high resolution in this densely wooded landscape, I think has provided us uh, with some brilliant examples of relatively very minor roads. Um, surviving as earthworks in woodland um, and often where these pop out into modern ploughed fields there is no trace whatsoever um, so two examples here on the right um, this is little college wood near kidmore end in oxfordshire uh, oxford end of the chilterns um, where hopefully you can see we've got some interesting features um, we've got this very clear 
enclosure, rectilinear enclosure with a sort of antenna ditch. Um, we think morphologically this is very likely to be late Iron Age or Roman rural settlement. And then over here in Little College Wood, hopefully you can make out, we've got a, a sunken feature running through here, which we think is probably one of our sea roads, one of these minor trackways. Um, coming off it at a right angle, you can see we've got another sunken feature here that then sort of dog legs up and heads off to the north this way with the blue arrows, um, which to us looks like a spur of this little sunken hollow trackway. And surrounding them, you can see these faint pale lines, which are almost certainly field boundaries of a field system associated with this, probably all dating, we assume, based on the morphology to the, to the later prehistoric and Roman period. Um, so we think this is quite a nice example of probably relatively minor roads joining rural settlements to, to fields and then maybe into the, the wider road network else uh, beyond. Another example here, this is in Watlington Park, again, Oxfordshire. Um, you can probably faintly make out um, this line kind of curving away um, and running into Greenfield Copse just here as a sunken feature, but with field boundaries all around coming off it, creating this coaxial field system related to this trackway. Um, and when you get your eye in, you can trace a lot of these features, you know, quite some distances, um, but always very, very subtle and always as soon as they pop out into ploughed fields, they become impossible to follow further. Probably my favourite example um, here in Wendover Woods, Buckinghamshire, um, where you can see really beautifully preserved, again, a sunken sort of hollowed trackway, um, doing this sort of dogleg, this sort of very sudden sequence of right angled turns, and all around it, hopefully you can make out those subtle hints of a coaxial field system, those field boundaries running up against it that give us this idea that this probably dates to the later prehistoric or Roman period. These dogleg bends are actually something we see fairly regularly in these kinds of features. And I think these are really interesting in, in making us think about um, the relationship and the chronology between field systems, rural settlement, and how potentially that's changing um, from the later Iron Age into the Roman period, for example. Um, potentially the roads are having to dogleg around field systems because those field systems already exist, um, ownerships already exist, and, and the roads have to kind of move around those um, when perhaps in the Roman period, there's a greater need to travel further to be exporting surpluses from these fields to pay taxes, um, where potentially villa estates are kind of starting to own large parts of this landscape with tenant farmers um, needing to travel to the villa sort of central um, places across the villa estate to, to bring their produce. Um, so yeah, some of my favorite features from, from the LiDAR data, I think these really beautiful, subtle little routeways and field systems that we just did not know existed in the Chilterns before we had this LiDAR data. Right, handing back to Nigel to finish on the Camlet Way. Thanks, Ed. So I'm going to dive into the, the Camlet Way in a, in a bit of detail because it's perhaps one of the most significant of the Roman finds from the project. Um, in 1926, Bernard described the Camlet Way as the Roman road from Colchester um, via St Albans to Silchester, now sadly relegated to a stretch of uh, short suburban street in St Albans. The earliest defin uh, definitive reference I've found to uh, a road being called the Camlet Way is by um, somebody called Grover in 1840, who calls it the famous Camlet Way. So it obviously had some notoriety then. Um, and elsewhere, he alludes to it having been seen excavations in Verulamium as early as the late, uh, the late 18th century. It's beyond the scope of today, um, to look at the, the, the entirety of its route, and there are indeed many uncertainties still. So I'm going to concentrate simply on the, on the route from it leaving Verulanium and then heading in a southwest direction through our area, um, the, the beacons of the past area. Uh, have I got control? Yeah. Okay, so uh, earlier I mentioned various historical researchers who had particularly looked at the Silchester end. So here I want to show the wider sort of landscape context for the whole of the route. Uh, we're looking at the Ordnance Survey topography here in grey with the modern Environment Agency flood areas marked in, uh, in, in blue. So, so here we've got the Thames, if you can see my cursor moving, uh, Verulamium up in the, in the northeast, Silchester down here, or uh, Claver Atrobartum down here in the southwest. And then we've got the cross-cutting valleys of starting in the, uh, in the north here of the Rivers Gade, 
the chess, the Misborn here, and the Y, and then as we pass onto the onto the Berkshire side, um, then uh, uh, the Loddon and uh, and the and the Kennet. Whoops, getting ahead of myself there. And um, for those less familiar with the area, this is the uh, the edge of the Chiltern Escarpment here. Uh, this is the uh, the M40 running through here, and this is uh, this is Heathrow down here, just so you can kind of position yourself. And I've displayed on this the the route proposed by previous workers. I've already introduced uh, all of these to you. In brown here, we have Bernard in 1926. In blue, Boone in uh, 1957. The yellow are uh, Via Torres and Marguerite, or Via Torres in 1964 and Marguerite in 1973. Of course, the Via Torres is only um, interested in the areas the north of the Thames. Um, and in purple, McCollum um, out of the uh, uh, the Ordnance Survey archives, an unpublished piece of work in 1980. And then Trusco's uh, uh, Silchester Environments Project in 2017. And in the red here is this study, again, mostly north of the Thames. The white box here is labeled figure one on, the, on this diagram, but the, the white box here is the Hodgemore Woods area and um, uh, Ed previously mentioned the Pollard's Wood uh, section that was identified by uh, uh, Gover and Stadley on the uh, Environment Agency LIDAR data. Um, I think, oh, and also the, the other piece of ornament here is that the pink line is, is quite obviously the direct alignment between the, uh, between, between the two centers. And you can see why that might have been enticing for the Via Torres and Marguerite heading out it was to, uh, to a crossing point at Heads the Wharf. And an obvious macro scale observation to make here is regardless of whatever the precise route of 163 is, it cuts across the natural drainage grain of the Chilterns, orthogonal to most of the river co corridors. But with so many workers having looked uh, pondered so many different routes, we're, off, we, you know, we're left wondering to some extent, you know, was there just one single route, a principal route, or many, and I'm now fairly clear in my own mind that at least through much of Buckinghamshire, there was probably a single route. And I have a strong view that at the Silchester end, there were probably two routes. Uh, ooh, is that you, Ed? I've lost. Oh, I've still got control. Yep. Um, at the Silchester end, there were probably two routes into the town, uh, and Mike Fulford would say that they were possibly in different in use at different times. Um, but the complete route through the bark through Berkshire remains problematic, and, and I'm not going to cover that today. I will outline, though, the case what I consider to be the most likely location for the principal Thames crossing. Though I know I acknowledge there are other possibilities, um, but the evidence for them I think is uh, is is weaker. So what has the LIDAR added to the story here? Here is that linear alignment from Pollard's Wood across the Misbourne Valley and then down through Hodgemore Woods. We can trace this all the way to the north, uh, to the northeast, up to the Chest Valley. Um, and we know that there's a route exits Verulanium in, the, in this direction. It, it can be traced to some extent on the Environment Agency LIDAR data, but it's less clear. Um, but it's reasonable to assume that there is a connected route. Um, clearly, it's a major engineered feature. And it's of similar size and therefore probably of importance to, uh, uh, to Ermine Street and Watling Street, designed to carry significant two-way traffic. If we look, in more detail then at the, uh, uh, at the best preserve section, we can see the roadside um, pits as it crosses Pleistocene Thames gravels through Hodgemore Woods. And then down to the southwest here, we can see that its character does change. And here it's coming off the gravels and a shallow cutting has been eroded, presumably by traffic, as it descends into, uh, into the chalk and across a dry, dry chalk, chalk valley. We can also see in this image 
um, a circular enclosure up here in the north. As we're postulating that's a, a, a possible Romano British farmstead. And we can see an associated small aggregate field system. This is absolutely impossible to see on the ground. And it's very difficult to really understand what the relationship between this and the, and the road is. Um, but we can clearly see that the road and the field system is cut by ridge and furrow. And we can date this. We know that this is pre-1550 because that's the point at which this, uh, this woodland becomes established. Further to the southwest though, beyond here, it's lost in the urbanization of Beaconsfield. But we have seen that it's deviating north of the direct alignment and therefore it's unlikely to be heading for the, uh, the Marjorie and Viatoris proposed crossing of the River Thames at Heads of Wharf. So I've zoomed in a, a, a little bit more so we can see a, a bit more of the detail here. Here again, we've got the Thames. Now we're looking at, uh, 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 at LIDAR data. It's a composite display of beacons and environment agency data. Again, I've marked on the uh, environment age of flood areas so we can see where the where the, the, the drainage the drainage pattern of the river channels. And again, that white box there is uh, is is Hodge Moor. I've also marked on here the lidar trends in the darker pink, and potentially relevant map alignments in blue. This then gives us some sense of the possible complexity in the vicinity of Sarat and the Chess Valley crossing. The remaining ornamentation here then is um, Roman find spots from the past data in yellow. It's actually quite sparse, but not surprisingly with concentrations in the vicinity of Verulanium and the villa sites in, uh, uh, in the Chess Valley and also villa sites down at, uh, at Hambledon by the Thames here. And the orange spots are the significant rural sites from the Rural Settlement of Roman Britain project in orange. And it's worth emphasizing then the lack of excavation evidence excepting in the vicinities of, uh, of Verulanium and the villa sites. So that's really the extent of the data set. And I'm going to look at the, uh, at the Thames crossing in some detail because this is really the crux of the problem. If we've got a route that's, that's heading to the, uh, to the southwest, it seems to be deviating to the, to the north of the direct line as it comes out of, uh, into and out of, of Beaconsfield, but then where does it go? So here I've zoomed in, again, we've got the, uh, the, the Thames Valley uh, down here, and then this is the River Wye. Um, there are a number of possibilities as to how it gets across the Thames Valley. In this image, I'm particularly focused on the flanks. The direct alignment again is this pink dash, but there are some other significant linear trends in the LIDAR data here. There's a subtle, very subtle, almost too difficult to pick out in this, but there's a, a subtle uh, positive a, a feature across the Overs Farm region here. There's a feature that runs down the flank of the Y Valley, which starts off as a negative and then becomes a positive, which is very much aligned with the road that runs at the side of, um, of Woburn Church. And in Woburn Church, they have recovered some Roman building materials. And then there's a very subtle feature across the Hollands Farm region down here. You again, probably make out a subtle positive, uh, positive feature. And some Roman metalwork has been found in this area. And it's this area around Holland's Farm that I particularly want to focus in on. Okay, so I'm now zoomed in a little bit further again, and that, this is this feature coming across the Holland's Farm area. And I've layered on this the, um, the, the superficial geology, because I think the Thames floodplain is important. But particularly for how difficult or otherwise it might have been to cross the, uh, to cross the Thames at this point in time. The Pleistocene gravels, that is the glacial gravels, are the darker colours. So the darker colours here are uh, the, the remnants of um, the end of the, uh, of the last ice age when the Thames was actually flowing to the north and then out through the, through the wash to, to join the Rhine. And it's the pale yellow, which is the, uh, 
the post-glacial Holocene alluvial fill, the true floodplain, if you like, um, after the Thames had changed its course and was flowing to the south. The river channels making up the Thames are probably at the greatest extent in the very early Holocene, that's, that's roughly about 10,000 years ago. And thereafter, without a glacial spring meltwater feed, the river never had sufficient energy for significant channel migration. And thus it transitioned from a, a network of braided channels to more restricted channels. This wide area here at the confluence of the two rivers, the Thames and the Wye, is one of the widest stretches of the Middle Thames floodplain. And being just downstream of the Bourne End meander, the Thames has reduced its energy somewhat. And so it's likely to have remained quite marshy and exposed to some active river channel movement during the late Iron Age and Roman times. Cookham, for those that know the area, Cookham sits on a gravel island here. Uh, and I want to particularly, again, highlight this feature that comes across the Holland's farm fields and know that it's coming across Holocene alluvial fill. It also cuts across uh, and doesn't honor relic field boundaries, but is today followed by a footpath. Also on this image that I've marked in yellow, the line of the Marjorie and Viatora's descent to Heads of Wharf, and Macomb's route in purple. So Macomb comes down here. Macomb particularly didn't like Margaret's descent coming down a narrow and blind coom down to, down to the Thames. He saw that was uh, um, a, a, a sort of security risk, if you like. But more important really for this interpretation is the continuation of Macomb's route on the on the Berkshire side round here. This is along a pronounced engineered terraceway bordering the floodplain known as Cock Marsh and then ascending up Winter Hill in a series of ramps and flats. I'm not going to explore any further on the Berkshire side, but note that wherever the route crosses the Thames, there, there then remains two significant obstacles to overcome between here and Silchester. The first of which is this uh, chalk escarpment on the south of the Thames. Um, and this is the most obvious engineered line that climbs up that escarpment. And then the next obstacle would be the, uh, the, the River Loddon. Finally then, on here, a major housing development is being proposed over the, farm, <coughs> over the Holland's farm area. And as part of the pre-development investigative work, a magnetometry survey was conducted in 2019. And although it con concluded, and I quote here, there is nothing here of archaeological significance. It also at the same time highlighted this northeast southwest linear anomaly. And again, I quote, likely to be caused by a buried metal surface. And this is the same feature that we see on the LIDAR cutting across the fields here. So, so my contention then is that to cross the marshy Thames floodplain on this alignment, a causeway probably crossing broad braided river channels would be absolutely necessary. And that this aligns with the trends that descend down the flanks of the Y Valley and also points to the substantially engineered terraceway around Cock Marsh provides strong circumstantial evidence for this providing a most likely fording point. So, is the Thames crossing actually hiding in plain sight? Here then, really zoomed in, we've got the Thames, the floodplain of the Thames, the Cock Marsh region, um, the River Wye coming down here. This is that Holland's Farm area again. Uh, and I just want to finish by kind of showing you the, the sort of river eye approaches on both sides of the river at these two locations. So across Holland's Farm, and then this engineered trackway around uh, the edge of, edge of Cock Marsh. So looking in this direction, this is, this is what we see, modern footpath, um, very subtle feature in the LIDAR. And then over here on the, uh, on the Berkshire side, um, the terraceway, you know, just standing proud of the uh, of the floodplain before the track then ramps up the side of uh, um, side of Winter Hill. So, is that actually the Thames crossing? Is it staring us in in the face? 
be interested in people's thoughts on that. So I'm now going to finish with just a couple of slides to offer some summary observations on, uh, on, on what we think we've learned. Firstly, then on the Camelot Way, I think we can be pretty certain that a route of some significance did exist from Verulanium, and most likely at least as far as the Thames, but it would have made no sense for it to end at the Thames, so we can assume that there was a route or routes continuing on to Silchester. But the LIDAR data points to a crossing upstream of, um, yeah, upstream of Heads of Wharf. It is possible that several Thames crossings were in use, but there is strong circul circumstantial evidence, I would contend, pointing to a significant crossing point at Bourne End and then a continuation along Macomb's Terrace Way around Cock Marsh and up Winter Hill. A complexity of onward routeways through Berkshire should be expected, analogous to the network of B roads we see through the Chilterns. And understanding its route and construction might help us in understanding Roman settlement patterns, the transport intersections, and particularly the role of river transport on the Thames. And it's about a 75 kilometer journey, you know, perhaps taking three days between the two Roman centers. So we should expect there to have been way stations or mansios of some sort. I've not gone into this today, but the Knoll Hill, Waycott Hill complex of Roman buildings, which are about 25 kilometers to the northeast of Silchester and include a temple site, might be perfectly placed. And then there is some potential evidence that within Pollard's Wood, there's a significant enclosure of uncertain age which, although somewhat speculative, that too could be, uh, could be Roman. And then we need to broaden our thinking somewhat about what we mean and how we describe a feature as a Roman road. It appears that the routeways in use during Roman times were complex and variable, and it's likely that only a minority, the A-roads of their day, were surveyed and engineered structures consisting of paved daggers and side ditches. It's highly likely that many of the more minor roads, you know, R, B and C roads, have a longevity that predates the Romans and were simply reused and only in some instances and in some places where they enhanced and re-engineered to meet the prototypical standard. So, you know, is this more like the norm? So, you know, if Asterix and Obelix had ever visited, there's every chance that they would have found themselves floundering in, uh, in, in muddy ruts. And, and now we're starting to get an insight into a much more intensively used late Iron Age and Romano British agricultural landscape than has hitherto been considered for the Chilterns. So understanding the interconnectivity of this landscape and the routeways through it will be key to understanding the Roman rural settlement and economy, and may even help with exploring land ownership pre and post conquest, as, uh, as Ed suggested, with uh, these intriguing little uh, dog leg routes. But we're only just at the start of interpreting this. So finally, just to leave you with uh, an observation that we're not the first to have raised a question about the construction and state of the roads during the Roman occupation. This from one of the Vindolanda tablets dated to around about this time of the year in the second century AD. But Octavius is explaining to his brother that the roads are in too parlous a state for him to consider risking injury to the animals to deliver the freight from Catterick. And uh, we'll leave it there and thank everybody for listening. So I'll hand back control to you, Mike, I think. Um, yes, uh, and thank you very much for a fascinating talk, both Nigel and Ed. Um, Apologies if I start to get a little bit croaky. I'm going down with a cold, which appears to have got a lot worse over the last hour. So um, <clears throat> if I get desperate, I'll, uh, I'll hand over to Dave if, if he's still around, which I assume he is, hopefully. OK, we do have quite a few questions coming through. Um, by all means, continue to put them um, through to us while we're talking. If you guys are OK, okay for a while. Um, Bye. Unlike most organisations, we don't cut the Q&As short to about 10 minutes. 
um, which is something I personally hate. Um, it's the most important part of the whole thing very often. You get some really interesting discussions. So please keep them coming. To start, here's a question. Um, Jim wonders where, um, where the name of the Chilterns actually came from, and whether it could, could it be a remnant of a uh, possible Iron Age or prehistoric polity of some type that we're not aware of, maybe? Anybody any, any ideas on that? I've never heard of where the name comes from. Hey, that's one for you. <laughs> Sorry. No, I also I do not know. No. no. Sorry, Jim, we're at a blank. Um, from Martin Parker. Could the Romans have mostly avoided the Chilterns as a set of hills? I think he's, he's mainly talking about air roads here. I don't know if the area was wooded or not in Roman times. Certainly the LIDAR is showing that our, our sort of previous blank of, of an area where we did not know very much um, is showing that it certainly was farmed pretty extensively. Yes. Um, we still don't have many you know, major settlements, major you know, villa sites or anything like that, um, but certainly there's stuff going on here. Um, but yes, I mean, the, the main roads will certainly be wanting to avoid the very, very steep escarpments. Um, and that's why the um, Watling Street obviously cuts up where it does, you know, to avoid kind of the worst of, of that bit of uh, the Chilton Hills, really. And they use the, the dry valleys coming, um, sort of running at that um, south, east, northwest angle, often to traverse the hills, I think. Um, and why also I think we, we have these, these very deep, um, sunken ways on the escarpment because I think you know people have, have been needing to move up and down the escarpment for thousands and thousands of years and these of their own accord will be gradually forming into you know the obvious route ways to use mm -hmm. and so I think um, yeah drawing lines between those and other features is certainly always interesting. Yeah um, where are we? I might just add to that that I think it's um, it's I, th I, th I think it's no exaggeration to say that it's actually amazed us that everywhere we look, we we see small field systems. Mm -hmm. um, now we can't date those precisely, but they are of a morphology that su suggests late Iron Age, or kind of Romano-British. Uh, what we haven't found is kind of where the people that farmed them lived. <laughs> mm, that's that's interesting. Um work that we've been doing in in yorkshire is in, in some ways the opposite in many cases we've found where they live but the field systems are eluding us um one thing we we have found which i was going to ask you about myself but in my own question um is we we're really struggling to find relationships between um romano british trackways and the main roman road system um bay public a if you like and I, I did wonder what you've found in terms of the relationship between the two. Is the indication that most of the Romano-British trackways were actually pre-existing and therefore they don't really respect the Roman roads at all? Or have you got some sense that these may, some of them may at least maybe later and branching off the Roman roads? Really interesting question. Um, you, you never really know, do you, if it's just bad luck that you don't happen to catch a beautifully preserved, you know, intersection of, of major road with trackway in a lovely bit of ancient mm. woodland where it's been protected, or or is it, yeah, that the, the, the relationships are, are harder to see or, you know, less common. Um, certainly the bit in Hodgemore Wood, we do have the field system there, but we don't seem to have any other bits of trackway kind of intersecting with it, or at least not, nothing that's particularly clear. We do have two possible little bits of enclosure in there as well that we kind of assume are are related in, in date but again they don't seem to have the the obvious well-preserved c roads or b roads to go with them um and the lovely bits of well-preserved well actually no probably the the two interesting ones from the c roads would be the example i showed in greenfield cops wallington park and then the other example i showed at um uh, wendover woods because whilst we called those c roads um they're both right on the very edge of the escarpment and it's long been sort of hypothesized that there may well be a ridgeway route along yeah. the Chilterns, just as there mm -hmm. is in the North Wessex towns. Um, so it is certainly possible that, that bits of what we're seeing there may well be related to a very important routeway dating back, you know, 
uh, into the Neolithic potentially for for you know movement of flint and pudding stones and all sorts of things that people mm. like to like to explore. Um, so yeah, those examples near the escarpment uh, potentially yes we are seeing maybe some intersection of trackways and, and more major routes, but but we don't quite have a handle on what that more major route looks like yes. in a defined yeah. way. Um, the only other one that I can think of that had a nice potential intersection was that sort of um, uh, hypothetical example coming down Lily Bottom um, in Bedfordshire, which joins on to Nigel 168. 168, yeah. 168, um, where we have that beautiful kind of sinuous hedge field boundary surviving the LIDAR going on for several kilometres down towards Wellwyn um, that meets and intersects at a, a mm. one of the Via Torres routes, although it's it's not a particularly major route. Mm. Um, Before anybody pulls me up on field systems, by the way, I was specifically meaning some of the work they've been doing near Brough and Humber, because there are plenty of uh, late Iron Age field systems in Yorkshire, just to clarify that. Um, yeah, on, on what you were saying, Penny Jackson very much like your ABC uh, description. Uh, it, it is a good one. Um, she observes that it's odd to her that um, the Romans were such expert engineers, but didn't bother building ro local roads. And that really comes down to who actually built them in the first place, really, doesn't it? Uh, um, and who actually built them physically and who commissioned them in the first place as to, to the engineering of them, um, as well as their purpose. Uh, moving on, just bear with me a second, I'm going to flick to another email, here we go, yes, okay, Benjamin Franklin, um, would like to know where the name Camlet originates from. Yeah, so would I, I'm curious. <laughs> I think curious. he told us that the, the, the earliest reference was, when, when was it, was it? 18, 1870, I think yeah. it's the... The Not Reverend that. the Reverend Grover, but he's obviously in 18, 18, 1840 rather, 1840 is obviously something that um, is established with, with uh, within uh, um, antiquarians anyway. When I mean, he refers to it as the famous Camlet Way, but I but I haven't been able to trace it back any further than that. But there there, there is a cross cutting road running. Um, through the centre of St Albans, of, of not St Albans, of uh, Verulamium at St Albans, uh, which is why I'd uh, chosen to kind of reorient um, Rosalind Nibbert's map of uh, a plan of, uh, of, of, of Verulamium, so that you can actually see that it cuts through um, from the uh, from the northeast to the to the southwest, cutting across uh, across Watling Street. So it was obviously known in the early excavations of, uh, of Verulamium. But who named it and why? I don't know. No. Well, <clears throat> whether we'll get to the bottom of that or the naming of the Chilterns at some point, who the heck knows? Um, from Jill, did the road through Hodgemoor come out near the dog leg at the top of Bottrell's Lane? Obviously, local. Yes, yes Jill. Um, so, so I'm just going to uh, promote something locally here, Jill. I'm, uh, Jill, I don't, I don't think I know you, uh, but you obviously know the uh, the, the area uh, very well, and I know the dog leg that you that you mean, and uh, and you're probably aware that uh, um, apparently that was used by um, German pilots in uh, um, in the Second World War to navigate by <laughs> that particular dog leg. So it comes out, yeah, it comes out uh, um, just to the uh, uh, just to the west of there. Um, I've done a piece of work specifically on Hodgemoor, which will see its first airing, I think, in our local history project on uh, on on Sear Green, which you can find on uh, ourlivingvillage.org. Um, it's not up yet, but you will be able to look on there and 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 see a piece of work that I've done on Hodgemoor and be able to trace the uh, uh, the route in great detail. I'm sure you often walk in Hodgemoor Woods, um, and I'd be delighted to to show you exactly where it crosses the path. Uh, you can see it on the ground, but you need to know where to look. Okay, uh, meaningless to me. But... <laughs> 
Going, you mentioned dog legs. Another question from Penny Jackson uh, regarding dog legs. Um, I often notice them in modern roads where they cross a Roman road, and she's asking whether the ones that you've found on sea roads could actually be junctions rather than just dogging leg around, doing a dog leg around something. It's an interesting question, isn't it? Now we're all going to be looking for dog legs everywhere. <laughs> I think the, the the dog legs on modern sort of road crossings on on Roman roads are often because of, of safety, I think, aren't they? Because um, they don't want people shooting straight across the, the, the major road yeah. without stopping. Um, but but no, I mean, it's sort of an interesting thought, isn't it? I've, I've always assumed that the dog legs we're seeing are about respecting existing fields when the, yes. when the roots go in. Mm. Um, but it, it is interesting how frequent they seem to be, that, that the fields certainly seem to have sort of some kind of priority often over these um, little trackways. Um, yeah, no, it's it's a good question. Yeah, they, they, yeah, they, they can be um, surprisingly regular as well. I, I have to hold my hands up to getting thrown by one. Again, it was near Brough on Humber, um, where the turn is a perfect right angle and the two lines are parallel to each other and a very, very nice quarter circular curve. And when we saw this on the GF on the, the aerial photography before we did the GFIS, uh, you can imagine what we thought was going on. A potential Rom Roman fort, and all it turned out to be was a Romano British trackway doing a dog leg. Um, most of it you couldn't see on the aerial photograph. That actually brings me into a question yeah, from. Yeah, actually, yeah. Can I oh, just, sorry. I, oh, just no. add to that? Um, yeah, maybe we need to look harder, actually. I mean, I, I mean I've, it's occurred to me that where we see abrupt changes in direction, of uh, uh, even major Roman roads, mm. you know, I wonder. I wonder. You know, we 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 convince ourselves that they are um, resurveyed corrections. You know, we're changing direction yes. um, and and you know taking a mark on whatever the next landmark is. But I do wonder whether some of these junk, some of these uh, um, sharp changes in direction, are actually intersections of mm. uh, of of roads or trackways. Uh, only some of which get fossilized in uh, um, in the historical record and others sort of just sort of disappear. It's it's certainly possible. Um, and the, the, I can think of plenty of examples where the really major alignment changes um, often sometimes for not particularly obvious reasons. So there may be something in it. I've certainly not been able to find one. Um, but you never know. You could be right. Um, well, we we were talking about aerial photographs briefly. Um, Jeff asks if you've used aerial photographs such as Google Earth Pro um, on the open fields where you've got gaps in the features on LiDAR. Is that something yes. you did as part of the project? Yes. 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 And did you how useful did you find it? Um, the, the well, Google Earth Pro, as you know, kind of gives you that sort of uh, um, time machine. Mm. ability so you can see uh where the data exists you can see um uh, uh time time steps mm -hmm. in, the, in the data um and that's actually quite uh quite a useful facility to be able to compare you know one set of uh of aerial photos with another and see if crop marks show up in in, in one set and, and not in another um yes it is useful um has it enhanced our uh, um those gaps massively probably not it's it's tended to kind of reinforce stuff that we already yeah. knew about if you could see it in the uh in in the aerial photograph you can probably see it in the lidar um that doesn't necessarily mean you can uh, um you can see it in an aerial photograph if you can't see it in the lidar we're certainly um yeah. hindered in the chilterns a by the woodland b by the broad lack of arable farming um c by the, the geology isn't isn't particularly good at making crop marks so um, it, you know, we aren't in prime, prime aerial photo territory up in the, right. on the dips of the children. Um, about Hodgemore Wood, the next one from March, Mark Bletchley. HS2 runs just to the north of Hodgemore Wood, albeit in a tunnel. Did any ground survey work or geophysical survey take place? I think, I think we're um, almost certainly not. Uh, not. Nothing that we know of. It's, um, it's, yeah, he describes it as a little way to the north. Um, I guess it's a mile or so. So ah, we're, we right. are at, we're outside of the corridor that they have right. uh, um, that they have surveyed. I mean, the HS2 themselves uh, uh, flew 
very close based uh, uh, LIDAR survey along the whole of the route is, is my understanding. Ed might know a bit more than that. Um, I think down to 10 centimeter resolution. Nowadays at 25 centimeter resolution, but I believe they shot it at, uh, at 10 centimeter resolution, but a very narrow um, path. And certainly all, uh, and Mark probably knows this, you know, all the archeological work that they have been doing along the HS2 route has been in a narrow corridor. Yeah, uh, um, uh, very close to the uh, to the route. Mm -hmm. um, ah, a suggestion to do with Chilterns, possibly related. This is from Delwyn Matthews, who's a regular. Possibly related to the broader ethnic name Celt, according to good old Wikipedia. Apparently, um, yeah. Um, let me ask a question: Are there any plans to actually excavate some of the roads identified to more clearly date them, etc.? Um, so a few seem to have been, um, and he's, re he's relating there to a, a talk that Richard Hingley gave uh, just a week ago, uh, not to us, but another organisation, which um, he raised that issue. Dating roads is, well, <laughs> I'll leave that up to you Ed, to explain. <laughs> Um, in terms of plans, I mean, I'm no longer at the Chilton's A and B, so I don't have any personal plans to go and dig holes. Um, the good news is that Chilton's A and B does now have a permanent member of staff who, who's an archaeologist um, dealing with the historic environment. So there certainly is, are opportunities for, for work, more work to be taking place because before the Beacons of the Past project, there were no full-time archaeologists at the Conservation Board. Um, also lots of very active <gasps> local societies in the region. So um, no, definitely, I'm sure holes will be dug and things at, at some point. Um, I don't know of any immediate plans. Um, so South Oxford Archaeology Group did do work um, on uh, Goring Heath Parish kind of near Kidmore End where one of my sea road examples was um, with that little g-shaped enclosure and then the beautiful two trackways with field systems between them um, so that may be something they look at if they can get permission in that in that woodland but um, no I don't know of any immediate plans sadly um, just going back to uh, the Chilton's uh, etymology uh, Tyrone Hopes I think has posted the best answer that we have which is about the the Chilton Seatner, the people of Kelter or Kilter, um, mentioned in the tribal hydage. He's reminded me of that. But thank you, Tyrone. You, uh, I think, got the best answer there. He usually does. Um... Yeah. So let, let me just uh, uh, add a little bit more to the uh, um, to the excavation question. I mean, yeah, we we have, I think, uh, mentioned a number of times that, that the lack of excavation work that's taken place in the mm. Chilton region, and largely because of that, it's it's. Um, a relatively lightly populated part of the country and there hasn't been a lot of, of development-led uh, archaeology in, in the last what, 20, 20 years or so. Um, however, you know, I've laboured the point about the, 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 Thames, the possible Thames crossing down at Bourne End and uh, that liniment that, uh, uh, that cuts across what I call the Holland Farm site. site. I mm. uh, fully expect that, uh, uh, that development to go ahead in the fullness of time. Right. I don't know what that's going to be, but I would expect that there'll be a housing development take place there at some point. And we have at least put this on the radar of the uh, the local AGR, mm. uh, and they have actually now written into um, whatever development consent is in place that there will be some trenching um, takes place there ahead of uh, ahead of development. How low lying um, relative to the river is it that side? Well, it's on the historical floodplain, but it is a, I mean, there's plenty of housing around there. And of course, the um, the Thames is very well regulated these days. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's, it, well, it isn't dredged anymore, but it used to be dredged. Um, and mm. uh, and the flow is uh, is regulated using weirs. So, um, you know, it's floodplain. Um, that's <laughs> it what, that's is floodplain. The, that's <laughs> uh, but, uh, but I don't think it's. And you saw on 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 my maps there that it's part of. Um, I think actually that particular site sits slightly above the uh, environment agency flood yeah. prone area. Um, but hey, you know, with climate change, things are going to change. Well, what I was wondering, I don't know the area at all. I'm afraid, Nigel. Um, but from the images that you showed. I did wonder if in order to cross the Thames at that point um, would require some significant engineering to carry a road across it. Not simply a bridge, um, but leading up to the bridge, possible raised causeway, marshy ground to cross, 
we do have plenty of examples um, in this country and abroad of, of roads crossing territory like that where the engineering is simply enormous. There was a recent example in the Netherlands where they recovered 470 timber piles um, from a stretch of road that they excavated as part of a, a motorway development. Um, we've got a couple here. That the One of the best ones was near Bawtry, um, just going out of Yorkshire. Um, that's a, a good time ago now, but it was the same sort of thing. That's where the road from Lincoln crosses the River Idle. And they'd built up a causeway with huge oak piles uh, and beams running across, and the agar actually built on that. And I'm forced to wonder if a similar thing may have happened there. Yeah, and if they're going yeah. to build on it, is there a chance we might find something like that? Well, that that's that's that would be my hope. I mean, I think that's um, that's the most likely scenario for me. I I mean, I I think this is more likely to be a ford crossing of the Thames rather than it rather than a bridge. Ooh, but that but that whole. Really. <laughs> that whole area, though, I mean, mm. to you know, to get across a marshy floodplain, you'd have needed yeah. some sort of causeway. And and Ed and I have talked about, you know, the the nature of that feature is quite different mm. from um, where we see agas elsewhere. So I wonder whether the construction of it would have been mm. very different. The I have to pull you up on the the Ford issue because this is a big bugbear of mine, and I, I've, I'll I'm happy to make this offer publicly yet again. Um, if anybody can prove an engineered Roman Ford across a major river this, in this country, I'll give them £10,000. And I'm serious because I don't believe they existed. Um, we do have um, one very recently that came up uh, near Worcester, a, a lovely paved road heading down to the river, but it's only on one side. So we have got no idea if it appears on the other side or not. It could simply have been leading down to a wharf for all we know. Um, my point is that they're not practical. If you're building um, a major road to link to cities, particularly if it's for imperial use, the last thing you want is to have to wait two weeks to get across it in January, um, which with a Ford, uh, you would probably have to do with wheeled vehicles. Then It's not practical. And I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that it was never done. Minor uh, water courses, yeah, certainly. Um, minor roads, possibly, but a major road over a major river, no, I just don't buy it. it. Makes no sense to me, and I'm not on my own on that. At least uh, I can count Mike Bishop on my uh, supporters on that one. But if you can prove me wrong, great. Sometimes I love to be proved wrong. So there you are. There's a challenge. Um, I just want to say something very quickly about dating, which was in Delwyn, Delwyn Matthews's question uh, about dating roads because they are notoriously difficult. Um, in examples that I've just been talking about, where you may have timber, then timber can be dated and that can give us very very precise dates by um, dendrochronology but apart from that unless you're really lucky to get um, Roman pottery or possibly a coin built into the actual road structure which will tell you at least it can't be older than that um, we're very lucky if we get any dating evidence at, at all there there is a technology um, called OSL, optically stimulated luminescence, which is getting increasingly popular and its accuracy is getting better. All there are still some question marks about it, but um, that's where you can actually, without going into the technicality of it, you can theoretically date the last time that light shone on the material that, that built the road. So, but it, it does depend on the makeup of the chemical makeup of the of the actual material itself. Um, you need a high quantity of quartz, if I understand it correctly. Um, that's more your area than mine, Nigel. Um, I just wanted to get that in because it's a question that we get all the time and it's a really difficult issue. Um, but maybe we'll get there with time. The technology will get better. OK, now I've, we, we still have one or two questions coming in. Um, I've left this one till the end, close to the end anyway. Uh, this is from our own Dave Armstrong. Um, from your experience, so this is to both of you, um, from running community projects with volunteer work groups, can you advise on what are the do's and don'ts um, and what works? And is there anything that didn't that you tried? 
we obviously have a huge interest in this because it's something we do ourselves and we have big plans for doing quite a lot of community work in the future. That's a really interesting question. Um, from the point of view of the Chilterns project, um, we got huge interest in in the portal, I think putting up something uh, innovative and new that people hadn't seen before, um, got people really excited at, at, the, at the start. And I think in total we had, I mean, depending on how we quite count it, you know, we had over 10,000 people in total kind of sign into the portal at, at various points. But the, um, the really big finding I think from it is that of the, I think in total about 14,000 records were created something like 95% of those were created by less than 10% of the users. So yeah. you get, you know, we got this, yes, you sort of imagine yeah. it as a curve, it, it, you know, it's, um, mm. you get, you know, vast majority of your work is done by a very small subset of very enthusiastic individuals like Nigel. Um, yeah. And and lots of most people just dip in, have a go and then, and then leave again and don't kind of get quite so engaged. Um, so there's definitely something to be said about kind of trying to create that deep engagement that keeps people who are actually going to do the work as it were, you know, who are going to really mm -hmm. contribute to things. Um, and I, so I think kind of having in-person activities and, and I'm sure, you know, Chris Smart's kind of way of doing things of lots of small setup teams that are deeply engaged rather than our approach of just this very broad open-ended citizen science, anyone can sign up. Um, you probably achieve the same things, but but in different ways and, and probably more cheaply by by going directly to people who are going to help you rather than mm. leaving it open ended. Um, I think the world of you know the internet is making kind of remote volunteering ever more easy, and that's definitely something to exploit. I think and and finding platforms on which to 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 build a system that allows people to contribute directly into a database without needing to have someone typing up lots of handwritten notes mm. or, or kind of transcribe things um, definitely I think is worth doing. We had a system of um, kind of quality control because obviously we had 14,000 records from lots of people who logged on for half an hour and then went away again. Um, and so we had we um, had sort of training for users who were keen to kind of stay more involved to train them up to become reviewers and they then looked at the data coming in from the citizens and, and helped turn us into turn it into our kind of eventual database that was then uh, you know producing data to be given to HE, local HERs um, so maybe having that sort of two-tier quality control process is needed to make sure that your end product is is what you want it to be um, without the, the diversity that having lots of people working on it would, mm -hmm. would normally naturally bring. Mm. Um, so quite a lot of that actually marries with with our own experience with um, mainly with the geophysics. We get a lot of people in, involved initially, but that very soon whittles down to a couple of diehards who turn out in all weathers and uh, do the vast majority of the work. Um, possibly again, it's a the, the broader approach might not necessarily be the right way, right way to go about it. More targeted, like Chris has done in Devon and uh, and Cornwall, might uh, achieve cheaper results as you said so, so you you clearly you clearly need a few cheerleaders um but those cheerleaders need to be fed in some way they need to be kept engaged yes um because it is voluntary effort and playing into a vacuum doesn't work well you know you need they need they need to have some feedback you know what mm. they're doing is they uh, is is is, con is contributing and, and worthwhile I think, um, and I think Ed, uh, I'm not being critical here, and I think you probably ad ad admit this. You, with with this project, were absolutely gobsmacked by how much was actually being found, um, and, uh, uh, and and so, in a sense, the the project grew like topsy, didn't it? You know, um, and therefore, probably the idea of just taking the gloves off and letting people do whatever they wanted, wherever they wanted, in an uncontrolled, in a sort of uncontrolled manner. Um, was not the most efficient way of doing it. And I liked Chris Smart's a, a, approach, particularly by doing it parish by parish, because yeah. that way you kind of you you could you could march through the landscape where, you know, the funding for this particular project has come to an end, um, but there's still a lot of loose ends out there, and there's still actually a fair amount of uh, of, of data that's not really being properly looked at, because it hasn't been in anybody particular person's backyard, or they haven't had uh, they haven't had the Kind of the knowledge or the interest to go and look at that particular part of the country mm -hmm. uh, and, I, and i would also add then to that one, one of the points is quite a lot of inefficiency by having 
how well however many hundred if you, even if it wasn't ten thousand how many hundreds of people going in and looking at the same stuff the number of people who spotted that roman road across hodgemore probably is you know a legion <laughs> <laughs> um you know great to have spotted it first but mm -hmm. then for lots of other people going in and spotting it where it's all well we've done that one you know can we move on and go and look at something else you know it's, you it's, couldn't really it's miss sort of it built though, in inefficiency <clears throat> Anything else to add on that, Ed? Or no, definitely really good points. Um, I think the other other I think brilliant thing from the project was the amount of local knowledge that is out there. You know, mm. it's, the knowledge is not just in in the hands of experts; it is in local communities. Uh, you know, people with a real enthusiasm for landscapes, people who have walked in those landscapes for decades potentially and know every stone, yeah. every field wall. You know, have researched everything, and I think that was a real um, sort of win from the project was the amount of amazing detailed local knowledge that came out mm. from people kind of contributing to records saying oh yeah i know about this it was you know i remember the farmer doing that when i was a kid and, and things like that which yeah was was um invaluable can i ask um about the demographic that you got um volunteering mm. uh, um, i'm sure you're well familiar that the the majority of archaeological societies um that are still active their membership tends to be um of a certain age um very very few younger members um and it has to be said tend to be middle class not always but tend to be um what was but, but i have noticed that changed slightly with projects like yours how did how, what did you find yeah i mean it didn't change as much as we wanted to and unfortunately our we had sort of big plans to be getting into schools just about February 2020, March 2020. Ah, and um, right. so that did really hit our efforts to try and engage younger audiences with something that we'd hoped, you know, this online platform, online portal, born digital kids, etc. you know, would would engage them. We did. We had a few. We had a handful. But um, um, and actually, I have to say we didn't collect demographic data on age but i'm i mean from from the sessions that i ran you know the team sessions etc um yes absolutely the, the volunteers were predominantly kind of what you'd expect yeah. with a few notable yeah. exceptions um we did get quite a fun uh, geographic spread so we had people logging on from countries all over the world um you know to look at the data and i think something like roman roads and um you know british archaeology really does attract you know yeah. an international audience um which is really exciting it's really great to see people contributing from from the other side of the world so that mm -hmm. was nice um but yes your point about um generally middle class old you know older retired people with with the time um, yeah no, that that certainly was was still true um broadly i think one one of the other things you did do ed and, and, and you absolutely took the lead on this uh but it was probably a heritage lottery funding requirement is you did some I'm going to call it basic skills training, but actually it wasn't that basic. I mean, you did some quite advanced skills training in terms of uh, understanding of LIDAR and um, how, to, how to use GIS packages. Uh, and that stuff's out there. I think uh, I mean, it's still available, isn't it? I mean, there's, mm. there's some nice, yeah, yeah. Um, some nice uh, tutorials out there which are available to, uh, to, to anyone. Um, and, you know, that gave a fair number of people and projects a bit of a, a kickstart, I think, you know, gave people the confidence to go out and do their own mm. thing, not necessarily specifically on this data set or using these tools, uh, but on other LIDAR data sets and, uh, and, and other GIS projects. Mm. So that's quite a legacy as well. I'm, I'm going to come back in, in a second to what you were just talking about, Nigel, but uh, I want to put one last question um, from the audience. It's from Mark Bletchley again. Uh, he's interested in the relationship of Roman roads with Ridge and Furrow. Did you find any sections where the Rig and Furrow respected the road rather than just ran over it? It's a good question. I, I don't think we do have any. So, I mean, that's a great question, actually. And I, and I would think I, it's pretty well the opposite, I think. Mm. I think, you know, where, where we're where we're where we've got nice sections of Roman road preserved, um, if the ridge and furrow is not respecting that, it's because the field boundaries are not respecting it. Yes. You know, the field boundaries are cut across. So, you know, I made that point that this is not a deer street example in, in, our, in our topography. We're not, you know, we, the, the alignment of uh, um, 
of, uh, uh, of, of boundaries with the Roman roads. Um, well, there doesn't seem to be any. I mean, we're, no. we're just not seeing that at all. No. You know, so so was that deliberate, um, or were the people, you know, the I guess the the early Middle Ages, kind of late uh, late Anglo-Saxon uh, um, people, just not seeing what was in the landscape, or deliberately choosing to obliterate it? Don't know. It, it it'll come down, I would have thought, to the need for a road to remain in use. And as simple as that, um, if you need to go from A to B and the road's there, it's going to be used. If that need goes because the settlement disappears, for example, um, or trade changes, there's a whole host of reasons why that may happen, then the road or parts of the road could go out of use. And that's the point when the, the landscape may, may well change. Things cease to respect it. If certainly in my experience, wherever you've got rig and furrow that respects the, the line of a Roman road, 99 times out of 100, that road's still in use today. It's very rare, actually, that, you, that I've seen rig and furrow respect a Roman road where the road has gone completely out of use. There are one or two examples, but I'm not going to bore anyone with the details, but it, it is rare. I would also um, say the Chilterns is not a, a dense area for, for Ridge and Furrow, really, in, in the upland part of the Chilterns. Um, yeah. Um, certainly when you get off into the Vale of Aylesbury to the north, um, yeah. ton, tons of the stuff, but up in the Chilterns, not very much. Yeah. Um, somebody now will a hundred examples think, of where I'm wrong, but um, sorry, Nigel. Yes, I think we've already demonstrated this so in, anyway, Ed, that the, the major um, routeways through the Chilterns follow the, follow the river valleys. Um, and so they probably did before the the, uh, the Roman conquest. The Romans tended to use the same routes, and they probably continued in use after the uh, mm -hmm. um, after after the the Romans left. Um, and I've often wondered, particularly with regard to one six three, and again I alluded this to this in the presentation, the fact that it cuts across the grain of the Chilterns, you know, is probably a key reason why that fell into disuse uh, because it was hard work. <laughs> Hard work to keep that uh, to keep that 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 road going. Yeah. Yet I can think of others that um, that do similar. Um, you know, it's certainly a couple of examples I can think of where they are still in use. So it 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 depends on need versus um, what's the word I'm looking for now? Um, oh God, I can't think of the word. Um, cost benefit analysis, really, isn't it? Um, whether it's worth going that way or isn't it the easier route going around it turns out to be the, the better option. Um, still can't think of the right terminology, but you, you know what I'm getting at. Um, but there certainly are examples. I've, I've just finished writing a paper actually on a road in, in North Yorkshire, which does exactly that. It goes right over the hill. It, it goes across three dales, just over the hill, down the bottom, over the hill, down the bottom. It takes a very good route to do it, but it does do that because they needed to. It's going through an area of lead mining and the principal purpose for it was probably just to get the lead out. Um, so it certainly does happen. Um, we can see it again in the, talking about Chris Smart's talk, the roads they found down in Cornwall doing very much the same thing on occasion, although they do tend to stick to the higher ground wherever they can. Um, I was going to ask you if there's no other questions from the audience. I don't think there is now. Um, a question about the actual LIDAR processing that you used. Um, you was was it entirely um, local relief model from the start, or did you experiment with other uh, visualizations before you hit on that one? Because there, there are so many around in these days. Yeah. Um, openness gets uh, particularly positive openness with the sort of features you might be looking for with a Roman road gets a lot of press I'm personally not that convinced about it but um so I processed a lot of data that's available as local simple local re the relief model and multi-directional hill shade are the two that are available on the portal mm -hmm. um those choices were my personal preference largely mm -hmm. um an initial aim of the project was to put more up and to kind of try and analyze what people preferred using from the right. data. So there was a question about, you know, which one did you use? Um, but I never managed to get any more up. 
Um, and so we didn't unfortunately follow that project string and look into right. kind of what people preferred. Okay. Um, but I think the two we had worked worked well and, and the portal allows you to sort of overlay them. So, and I, I particularly enjoy a, a sort of overlaid local relief model over the multi-directional hill shade sort of with some transparency mm. that means you can keep some sense of the topography that the local relief model has removed whilst also getting that sort of highlighting of, of the more subtle features. Um, and it's worth saying that the, the children's LIDAR obviously picks up all sorts of features. You know, it's not just Roman roads that we were looking for, we yeah. were looking for, no, course, for no. everything and anything. And so we we did want something that would be a good catch-all mm. um, for both negative and positive features, you know, both linear and discrete okay. and yeah, all the rest of it. I, I didn't actually so, use so I, I, Sorry, I played around. I played around using the uh, uh, relief visualization tool um, uh, and processed the environment agency data in lots of different lots of different ways. Um, but still found myself coming back to um, a simple local relief model and, uh, and, and a hillshade model. And I suppose in part that is probably because it was what I was familiar to seeing in the uh, um, in the beacons data. But, I, you know, just generally was most useful. Um, mm. But, you know, kind of, yeah, I think you can play around with it. And I did do, but but I didn't get much more out of it. Yeah, I found the same, but I was just curious to see if other, other people's experience was similar. Um, I'm the same as Ed. I tend to to use local relief model and hillshade together. Um, find it gives the clearest results. Um, particularly if you're trying to prepare an illustration for people, it's more understandable. Um, adding the hillshade just it makes it a little bit more real. If you know what I mean? When you obviously when you're experienced with local relief, yeah, local relief model and some of the other visualizations, you get to understand them fairly quickly. But for the uninitiated, they can be a bit confusing at times. Skyview factor is probably my second favorite as being an easily interpretable one that that I think works reasonably well. And that was going to be the third one I put on there. Um, mm -hmm. But processing 1400 square kilometers was, yeah. was a big task and yeah, just never got. Did you pre-process it then before putting it out there? I never actually used the portal. So yeah, yeah, yeah. So so we re I received the data as um, uh, they, the contractors processed the um, LAS into a DTM and DSM for us. And then I then um, kind of created a workflow that mm. buffered tiles out to their neighbors, mm. then created the visualizations and then clipped them back down and then mosaic them so that you didn't end up with edges through the data. Just, um, and it, it sort of was about a week's yeah. work on a very powerful machine to do each. each Just both. for those less familiar with, with LIDAR, DTM stands for Digital Terrain Model. Um, which is what um, Ed was talking about earlier, where you just cut through all the vegetation and you're seeing the actual ground surface underneath, for the most part. Um, and DSM, Digital Surface Model, will leave buildings and trees in there in the imagery. Um, simple explanation of it. Thank you. Yeah. Each has their preference. I prefer DTMs all the time, but anyway. <clears throat> If there are no more questions, I'm going to wind things up. I don't think there's anything. Leslie, if you've got something, can you send it to me? If anyone is interested in processing their own LiDAR data, by the way, um, there is a handy tutorial somewhere on YouTube. Um, if you search something like um, Chilton's LiDAR processing, um, then you, you should find something with my face on it. And um, uh, I go through using QJS and um, really visualization toolbox, which are both freely available bits of software that you can use to process stuff. They're all on the portal as well, aren't they? Those videos. Uh, um, maybe, maybe certainly they'll be linked linked in places. Um, I can stick it in chat if anyone's interested. Bear with me a second. Um, right. Well, thank you very much. Um, to both Ed and Nigel. I think everybody would agree it's been an excellent and very informative and interesting um, talk, as has the Q&A. Um, we had at peak, I think, 185 this evening, which is a good audience. And I just want to make a special thank you to those few people who made a donation to help support the costs of putting tonight on. It's very much appreciated. Thank you. And um, with that, um, I'm going to bid you all good night. What we usually do, guys, we'll normally close it down. And then if you want to have a chat afterwards, very briefly, we'll open the meeting up again just for the team. OK, right. 
And with that, I wish everybody a very good night. Thanks very much for coming, everyone. Yep, thank you.